Welcome to the Veterinary Project Podcast, episode 026. Welcome to the show created by vets featuring absolutely no pets. This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, hosted by Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Our resident veterinarians have swapped out their stethoscopes in favor of microphones to bring you the Veterinary Project Podcast, a show focused on real conversations aimed to connect this amazing profession full of remarkable people. Through the sharing of collective stories and wisdom and connecting over the many unique challenges we face, we invite you to join our community of veterinary professionals leading intentional lives. And now, here are the hosts of the Veterinary Project Podcast, Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Welcome back to the Veterinary Project Podcast. You are joined by yours truly, Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. A snowy weekend here in Alberta. What's it looking like your way, Dr. Bug? Johnny, I I don't like bringing up the weather because it's depressing this time of year. So I haven't even looked because we've had warnings all week basically saying like, don't even look this, this weekend. It's supposed to hit minus 50 with the wind chill. So just for context for all us American listeners here, I looked up minus 42 because that's where it was in Saskatchewan about a week ago. And minus 42 Celsius is about minus 41 Fahrenheit. That's how cold it is in the northern prairies right now. Yeah, I looked up uh, for some buddies I have in the States. It's minus 58 is what they're saying it could get down to, which is just ridiculous. That is ridiculous. My kids and wife are a rock star this morning. They took out the wagon. They went for a walk. My wife came back and said, it feels good. And it's minus 35 out. Yes, not good at all. But let's get on some more fun things today here. We're switching it up. It's the two of us today. Before we get into that, let's move into a quick tip. All right. So normally we shoot these intros after the episode with this kind of uh, change of format. We're shooting it before. So I'm assuming this is going to lend itself to today's conversation uh, when we dive into everything about contracts. So my quick tip for everyone is if you don't ask, the answer is no. You know, and that goes in all areas of your life. If you're negotiating anything, if you don't ask, it's no. Love it. Love the tip and fits exactly into today's discussion. So Mike and I are switching it up. We're going to keep this shorter today. There is no guest. You are listening to the experts and or the perceived experts. We've got them in quotation marks. (laughs) And today's discussion is going to be around associate veterinarian and or RVT and or any contract in which you're being asked to sign or you need to partake in in a veterinary clinic. With that being said, this is opinion-based only. This is educational learning, but please go seek true legal advice if you want to get the real lowdown, the full lowdown on contract orientation. This is us discussing our experience, um, my having put together dozens of contracts over the past six years, and what I've seen to learn from both new associates as well as specialists um, with decades of experience. So in this episode, that is what we're looking to help with. Okay. And I want to jump in here um, because, yeah, Jonathan, you have, I guess, whatever, six, 10 years, however many years experience sitting on both sides of the table, right? Because you've had to negotiate contracts for yourself. And then you've had to negotiate contracts um, when hiring people. And when we were kind of quickly chatting about this pre-recording, not only do you recommend seeking professional advice and lawyer's advice, you were saying you can tell instantly if someone sits down like and comes back with a contract who has engaged a lawyer and who hasn't? So it, is, is it correct? Is it fair to say it's not just um, friendly advice? It's like prudent and will get you a better result. Most definitely. And there's contracts depending on the scope and size of that contract where it's literally going to make you sign off that says you have 
had the opportunity to seek independent counsel ahead of signing this contract. Mm -hmm. A smart employer will put that in there to prevent potential legal liability later if things don't go well. And that's what contracts are. They are to lay out the terms of how our working relationship is going to go. But in the employer's format as well, it's also going to lay out all the possibilities that if could go wrong is going to prevent them from having to pay out excess of funds if there's been nothing wrong done on either side. And people many times don't realize that. So yes, in setup for this, if you have to go spend $500 to go seek legal counsel, go do it. It is so worth it and can save you in the long term. Yeah. For those that are just coming into practice here now, this is brand new. And I've talked with a couple of schools about this um, and students. And it's really interesting to see what's coming up now. And by the year, what people are asking for in their contracts is changing. So we're going to walk through it. So we're going to walk through a, a classic contract set up this morning and talk through some of the different permutations. And Mike's going to add in his flair and questions and keep me on track because this is something I get pretty excited about pretty quickly. Yeah. And I mean, I'm excited uh, to, to learn from you on this. Um, one thing I want to add in just on what you've said so far is, you know, it's really easy because it's so exciting, you know, entering it, a, a new place of employment. And maybe this is your first time ever as a veterinarian, you're really excited to get going. So everything is very rose colored glasses. And, and truthfully, all of my experiences, that is what everyone is intending it to be. Definitely. So it so it can be difficult to step back when you're dealing with a contract and think of, okay, well, what if this doesn't go well, right? Because that's really where contracts can save your butt. Um, and it's sort of that preparing for worst case scenarios, which we're, we're not trying to like put that intention out there, but reality is sometimes that's the way they go. That's correct. And we need to plan for that in the in case chance it does happen. Yeah. Yep. So we're going to stick to the big buckets. There's going to be portions of a full contract that we're not going to touch today, but we're going to look at the big buckets. So our first bucket that I'm going to look at is one, the position. Position's pretty straightforward in veterinary medicine. Depending on what you're coming in as is what that's going to be defined in the contract. So if you're a veterinarian or an associate veterinarian, it's going to be called that. If you're a technologist and or a tech assistant, it's going to be called that. If you're a receptionist, it's going to be placed. And that's also going to structure how complex that contract will be. Really straightforward. The second piece that's not so straightforward is average weekly hours. So for my standard veterinarians that I've brought on board, they tend to be 40 hour a week contracts which means in a full year, you're going to be looking at doing the standard 40 hours per week times 52 weeks. So that's going to give you your average working hours over the year. There are many times in both RVTs, veterinarians, TA standpoints where it's not 40 hours and you need to know that. So if it says 37 and a half hours, have to understand why there is that breakdown. If it's 32 hours, 32 hours is equivalent to a 0.8 full-time equivalent. So you're working four days a week. 37 and a half hours could actually be where you're working a full eight hours a day, but you actually are docked for the half hour pay for lunch, which comes down to 37 and a half hours. Many of my new team members don't understand that. And that definitely depends on the employer you're working for. So if you see 40 or 37 and a half hours, that's the reason why. And many people don't understand that. Yeah. And that's a good point. I've, I've uh, encountered that right where you're, where you're working full time and you think 40 hours a week, um, but you're actually having that lunch break in there. So I, I, my question to you, Jonathan, is how do you navigate um, people working right through lunch, right? So contracted for 37 and a half, but they're never, they're not taking lunch break. And then another sort of similar but different question is, what about stuff that is just outside the vet clinic? So where I'm going with that is, for me, um, there would always be requests on your time, uh, you know, like Sundays come, come uh, to this community event, and our, we have a booth set up, and we'd like you to, to be there and answer questions or go talk to kids at this school. 
um, and sorry, that might be coming, but sort of out of scope contributions. Great question. So I'll talk about the lunch hour specific. Um, love technology and where it's come in. Technology is provided for, uh, depending on where you're at, you can actually do fingerprint for coming into the clinic and leaving the clinic. So you actually know the time that you're on duty, so to say. Um, there's another program out there where you can, again, just via an app, easily clock out for lunch and clock back in. It really depends on the advancement of the employer you're working with. If you're doing an actual 37.5, what's chances are happening is the employer is automatically docking the half hour. So you don't even have to deal with that portion. And if you work again, depending on the legislation in the province or the state you're working at determines what your availability or eligibility for lunch hours are. And that's really specific. So I don't want to go right there into the, the deep because it, it changes by the province or state. And that's very specific. So some require you after five hours, you have to take a half hour lunch. Some don't require that. And you, it's up to the individual to know that. And it's then up to the employer to follow it. Now, where we get into a little bit more of a gray zone is those after hours contributions. That again, if you feel that you need that defined in contract, your time to ask for that is at the start. So if you are coming in for a um, uh, open house, et cetera, that should be paid for. That is an expected time to be at work by the employer. That's not on an employer voluntary basis, unless it's really specifically um, spelled out and you've signed off on that. That's where it comes in. Now, gray zone comes in and I've chatted about this in a locum capacity with multiple locums is if you're expected to do medical records after hours and that's spelled out in contract saying you're only working for the time period that you're seeing cases, well, guess what? You're only getting paid for that. So you better be efficient with your medical records or you better negotiate into that, your contract. Yeah. And that's a great point. Um, having it crystal clear up front, you know, those, those things that maybe get unspoken and then pop up six months into your, into your job. That's correct. Yeah. And the fun thing about contracts is, and I, I think they're fun is they're flexible. Meaning if you're doing a great job, if you're bringing value into the business, if you're really showing that enthusiasm, positive culture, and adding to the team, your employer wants to keep you. I can guarantee that, especially in this day and age in 2021. Work with that because the employer wants you just as much as you want to be there. So if something's not working, bring it up. I have some current employees where we're going to go into their contracts earlier than when they're actually due and make some increases for them because it's appropriate for that time. Okay. I have a question and this could send us down a tangent. So I'm, I'm, I apologize, but it's a valid question. So it's kind of uh, which comes first, the chicken or the egg. So as an associate negotiating on your behalf, saying, you know, I am going to deliver, I'm going to do a great job for you. My, my, you know, like production numbers, if that's a metric we want to use are going to be great. Sure I want X. I want to be well, well compensated for that versus I'm going to show you, I'm going to, I'm going to deliver, you know, six months of deliverables. And then I expect that. So I don't know if I'm wording that right, but there are. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So let's, let's go there then. So let's talk about what your pay rate is. If you are a new grad in 2020 in Canada, I pulled this off the CVMA, the Canadian Veterinary Medical Association website about an hour and a half ago in Alberta, Saskatchewan, your median wage starting is around that $80,000 rate. And that's small, mixed, or large. Now that can vary a little bit, but that's what the, the numbers are showing us. As a new grad coming out, you have no basis to negotiate based on production other than an experience, your attitude, um, past references that you might have been able to gain in school that we might reach out to. So there's a lot basis on your personality, what you're bringing to the table, as opposed to what you can produce. It's harder to do that as a new grad, and I'm not going to buy it as much because I want to see you in action, and then we'll talk about increasing. Yeah, it. 
And that's kind of where I'm going. So I'm a new grad. I sit down in front of you and I say, I'm worth a hundred K because I'm going to be the best you've ever seen. What are I you going to say? What are you going to say back to me? I'm going to say, I love your enthusiasm. I love your negotiating skills. I'm going to probably start you at 80. And if that's not good and we're not in the right ballpark, this isn't the right place for you. Yep. And again, I'm using 80 as an example. That's not, that's not the be all end all. But if we're that different and the starting wage is 80, I love your enthusiasm, but that doesn't fit within the metrics of what we see for a starting grad. Because a starting grad right now is going to be producing in between, I believe the numbers are around 350 to 425 in their first year. So if you're saying you're worth 100 grand in that first year, and I'm bringing my calculator out, I believe that's about a 33% production rate if you're, make, if you're only bringing in 300 grand. Now, if you're bringing in 350 grand, and I divide that by $100,000, the wage you've asked for, yeah, 35%. Mm -hmm. yeah. Our, start, our average production rate for doctors is rated, depending again on where you're at, and we're talking, I'm talking Canadian specific and even more Western Canadian specific, we're looking at that general practice or emergency practice of a 22% production rate. Mm -hmm. So at 100 grand, at a 22% production rate, you need to be bringing in around $450,000 for that to match up. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I'm asking this question more, um, you know, devil's advocate for the listeners. Uh, Cause I do see that. I hear that when I talk with people that this can be a source of frustration and I can see it uh, from the, from the clinic owner's point of view where it's like if you deliver it so so now me and you are one year down the road and i'm i'm producing five hundred thousand of production are you gonna have any problem giving me that wage i want it even sooner than that mike i'm gonna back it up for my practice i want to be able to show you that product i need to show you that production on a month-to-month -month basis so you as an associate know exactly where you're at and that comes into this contract negotiation if you've picked just a straight salary for the first year which again people have their different variances of tolerance on risk whether it's straight production a sal pro model or just a straight salary i as the employer i want to give you that production rate that you're earning month by month, because if you are making 500 grand by year one, yes, you're going to get a sizable increase. And because your value you're bringing into the clinic is actually more than what I'm paying you for. And sometimes that happens earlier. And I have been a part of that where it's happened earlier, which is fantastic. But going into the contract negotiations again, to this point is you as the associate need to know what is actually in that portion of production. So what are you being paid on? Because there's categories that depending on who you go to work with, those categories actually won't be provided for towards your production totals. I'll give you an example. Some practices will pay on cremation and cremation services. I'll use that as an example. Some will or will not pay a full amount on the food that is actually put through your name. That's a big one. Or it will be a decrease percentage. So if you're getting that 22%, maybe it's a lesser amount, or maybe you get the first bag and not the bag, bags after that. On prescriptions, maybe you get the first prescription and then a decreased percentage on the refills afterwards. These are questions you have to ask your employer ahead of signing a contract because it does affect your production total. Mm -hmm. And if your employer doesn't know that, then you need to help them know that because it's important. Yeah. And this, um, I mean, I can't stress that enough knowing this exactly. Um, is it, is it a straight rate? Is it a like yeah. blended, you know, services versus versus okay. inventory items. Um, I've been in lots of situations like food. If you prescribe a new food, you get credit for the first bag, but not subsequent. That's correct. Um, and cremation. I would, I would just want to double like echo that. Cause you know, that, it can get to be significant. It you can, know? unfortunately, in our world, right? A cremation makes up, there's a percentage there of your, your clinic's gross revenue and cremation is not a small number. It's a number we pay attention to. And am I giving that? And, and here's, a, here's, a, here's a something. For the majority of the time, the cremation services, whether it's dealing with afterlife care, whether it's private cremations, general cremations, 
urns, spreading ashes, etc. That's usually never discussed by the veterinarian. It's usually your registered veterinary technologists, your tech assistants, or your receptionists that are doing that. So here's where I'll go back and forth with the, with the veterinarian is going, is that really a production category that you are in essence, the most important person to be a part of? Probably not. So therefore as an employer, am I going to pay for it? Probably not. Mm, no. But until we have that discussion, you don't know. And if we don't have it, that's where resentment can build over time. 100%. Excellent. So let's go down. Let's continue down that rabbit hole in terms of pay. So I had said $80,000 as the average for a new vet out of practice, uh, I mean, out of school, et cetera. But then you look at it and you go, okay, am I going to earn a salary? Which means bi-weekly every two weeks. So 26 pay periods in a year, I'm going to get paid that same salary amount. If I'm rocking out of the park, or doing really bad, I'm going to continue to get paid that same amount. Or am I going to have a salary plus production, which is my favorite, which means I'm going to set the salary that I think I need to live on, meaning if I have a mortgage, other expenses, student debt, I need to have a certain amount. So let's say that salary amount, I'm going to use 100 grand as an example. But I also want to earn if I'm rocking out of the park, and between me and the employer, I'm going to figure out what that percentage looks like. So as an example here, if I'm a seasoned doctor and I'm now making $100,000 and I go, okay, I, I need a certain salary per month to live because I have expenses, et cetera. And if I'm earning 100000 on salary, that means if I'm actually gaining on a 22% production level, I need to make $454,000 per year of production to match that 100,000. But I want to make more on top of that. So if I look at that $100,000 and I divide that by 12, that comes out to a production total of 33,000 per month I have to make. And if I'm using a 22%, sorry, that's at 22%. If I'm making 25%, that equals 400K per year I have to make in production. This is where people get confused. So if you're making 25% of anything you bring in, that's one divided by 0.25, and that equals four. So I just take my salary, it times it by four. If I'm making 22% production, that's one divided by 0.22, and that equals 4.54. So I take my 100 grand, I times it by 4.54, I've now got $454,000 I need to bring in to match up to that 100 grand. Then the employer is going to take anything above that and pay you a production bonus. And that's paid out on the second pay of the following month. And you're guaranteed that. And also what that means is you can't slip below that salary. Sorry. And I just want to jump in to make sure we're really clear here. Yep. I'm trying to be as clear you're, as possible. You're, you're guaranteed the base salary. Correct. And then you will be paid out any production above that, but it is Correct. not a guarantee that you will earn enough to be paid that bonus, right? That That's totally correct. depends on what you produce. So as that example, the hundred thousand dollars, 22% production, you need to bring in more than $37,833 to get any type of production bonus. If you don't produce that much in one month, you're still going to make your salary. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of a Sal Pro model. There actually is risk, more risk to the employer that way. And it makes sure that the employer has really good employees that know where their production levels are at. Because if you're only making $25,000 production, month on month on your employers like it it's not looking good right now yeah so let's quick question on that tangent let's say there is a gap um so i you know the technical term would be negative accrual That's right correct. so if if um you know say the metric is you need to hit thirty seven thousand, but you're hitting 30 so you're falling behind seven thousand month after month how is negative accrual being 
um, used in 2021 or is it being used? What are you sure saying? is? Yeah. So I've had doctors that have worked for me in the past. They're like, Jonathan, I don't want a base. I don't need that salary base because I'm confident I'm going to do well. I've got the experience. Here's the emerge. We're producing enough production. I go, fantastic. What is the draw that you want? So instead of a salary guarantee, they're pulling a draw every month against that production total. So if they're going to pull a draw, that means that positive balances above that draw amount are going to be paid out the same thing as a Sal Pro. But here's the exact same. Here's the, here's the verbiage is positive balances are when the production earned is in excess of the monthly draw. And that difference is paid out each month. Where in any given month, the draw pay exceeds production earned, the employee will owe the employer the difference. And what does that look like? Oh, the employer, the difference. Do they need to cut a check or do they work it off? They work it off. So right here, I'll read this out. Just looking at it. There is a continuous rolling balance that will either be zero or negative. And there's no end date for that plan. Meaning if you're 5,000 in the whole, so to say, in one month, because you took a vacation, there was nobody in the clinic, et cetera, that 5,000 in the whole will be covered off in the subsequent months going forward. Mm -hmm. And depending on the employer, I, again, I've never worked or been an employer where there hasn't, and this is really, um, this is a good discussion with anybody bringing in on a draw plus production model. I've never been a part of a discussion where we've actually had to have one of an employee's draw, write a check. I've not ever been a part of that. Mm -hmm. And that's really exciting. And it's actually, it's the discussion at the start that sets that up for success. If that employee is saying, Hey, I want to earn this huge draw. I'm like, it's just not feasible given either your specialty, the circumstances of the clinic or how much production has been drawn in there in the past. Well, then we're setting you up for failure. And that's a discussion that should be had at the start. But there are some people that um, that's not good enough. That's there's too much risk in there. And I say, fine, drop that draw total down, or let's talk about a sell pro model that might be more in your earnest. And it, any good employer will do that. Yeah. So there is options there. It um, sure you know, is. For someone that is maybe uh, a little bit nervous about the idea of having a negative accrual. Most definitely. Yeah. And a negative accrual just rolls over. And again, as the employer, you need to provide that information to your employee so they know exactly what that looks like. Okay. And then last really quick question. Uh, monthly. Is monthly sort of the, the standard of when... Um, you know, production, I don't, I guess, bonus for lack of a better word, but when the numbers get ran and any payouts are made, is that typically monthly? Um, for me, when I was in practice, it was quarterly. Is there, is there a, a norm there? Everything that I've dealt with has been on the second pay of the following month. Okay. So you would receive your draw or your, your, yeah, you would receive your draw on the first pay and then you receive, it's not a bonus because that's, again, this is different. I can't use the definition because yeah. it's money you've earned. So it's it's not a bonus. That's where I was, even when I said it, I was like, this is not the right term because it is. It's money you earned. Like it's, that's your, right. it's, your, it's your money. Yeah. Yep. So no, so draw is the more appropriate term. That's correct. Yep. So that amount that you've earned, in my experience, has been paid out in the following month. Um, maybe it's quarterly. I wouldn't be comfortable with that. Cause that's your money being held by somebody out to be, I don't know that that's too long for me. Mm -hmm. No, that's a great point. I, I would prefer monthly over quarterly as well. Excellent. Um, so I'm sure there'll be questions there. I will hope that was as clear as possible on that. This is a hard, I literally have had two discussions with employers. Uh, I help consult some small businesses on the side here. And I've had two of these questions in the last week. Mm -hmm. It's great because People are being flexible, employers especially, in trying to set their employees up for success these days. I love it. So these questions are coming up. Nice. Yep. Um, second thing, uh, vacation. So vacation standard right now, three weeks starting out and moving up from there. 
it takes a while to get into the five week range. So for some of um, employees I've worked with that are just coming out of school and asking for five weeks, it probably won't happen. And if you're on a sell pro or a production model, the way your vacation is actually um, tallied is not, if you get a three weeks vacation, that's not 21 days. And this sometimes gets confusing. It's actually 15 days and it's actually booked and you're going to see it on your contract as 6%. So if you earn two weeks vacation, it's 4%. Three weeks vacation, 6%. Four, uh, yeah, four weeks vacation, 8%. And that's an accrual basis, which means it goes to the side so you can pull on it when you go on vacation. And that sometimes confuses new employees in. Mm-hmm. So when you take the when you take that time off, uh, you're basically pulling from that balance that has been set aside. That's correct. For those days off. Yep. And your contract's going to talk about it. Yeah. And it should have those specifics in there. Yeah. And it'll also, uh, an employer can negotiate blackout periods. And this is something that shocks young associates. What do you mean you're telling me that I can't take vacations during certain times? If an employer is asking that and you have signed off on that, that is possible. And that is very legal. Yeah. And it's going to be obviously practice specific. So I think back Mm -hmm. uh, one of the first places I worked mixed animal with a heavy beef cattle component. So if you try to take vacation during calving season and during fall run, uh, that's just a no fly because you're just putting so much more pressure on everyone else. So it was where I worked, it was not formally in the contract. Um, I guess maybe it, it should have been to be completely proper, but it was an unwritten rule that, you know, there's certain months that you, you just don't take vacation because it's all hands on deck. That's right. Yep. Um, correct. Uh, stepping into a couple of the smaller ones, continuing education. This is such a big one for me. Uh, make sure that you have a good number there that you think you're actually going to hit on a yearly basis. As an associate, whether that's $1,500 $2,000 as an RVT, whether that's $1,000, $1,500, $2,000 if you're a veterinary technologist specialist or VTS. Um, again, those numbers, and, and here's what I love saying for anybody recruiting, is that's not a be-all, end-all. If you're going into a situation where you need to go take some ultrasound uh, training, et cetera, don't be afraid to ask your employer, but come to them with a business plan, and it doesn't have to be super complicated, that says why you need up and beyond your continuing education amount, what the payoff for you as an individual is in terms of learnings, and then what you hope and plan to bring back to the clinic. It's so great to be a part of that and employ and, and team members that actually want to do up and beyond. Uh, it's very rare, I think, and I've seen where it's been declined. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I got offshoot questions on this again, but on, on CE, what are you seeing for, you know, rolling period, right? Like I know I was allowed to bank for, I think up to three years, but then it had to be spent. Uh, What's the, what's the standard these days? Uh, I've seen up to two years as a standard for the most part. I have seen it just used in that year. You lose it. you, You don't use it. You'll lose it. I've seen that as well. I think it really depends on the employer. Okay. Yeah. Um, if and, I, and, if, if, and as an employer, as an example, myself, if I'm paying out 3000 per year, I wouldn't want to bank that for three years. Cause that's then a potentially a $9,000 hit per employee. And I'm just talking, this is a back end cash flow perspective, which I don't know when that's going to go in. And again, I also have the second question. This works into some things we're doing on the side uh, this year is, if my employee is not going in for CE and continual learning, I have a different question. Why? That's a fair question. Um, and I think what you said is really important as it, for associate vets to understand if they've never been on the other side of the table is the, the business owner, the veterinary clinic has to carry that, you know, on their books. And if it's 3000, 6,000, 9,000 times 10 yep. employees or whatever it is, that number gets to be really large. That's right? correct. So that's where the um, kind of forcing the hand, like use it or lose it, because they can't carry it indefinitely. 
That's correct. And that's the same thing with vacation. Yeah. And that's on the, you know, uh, if the employer is asking you to cover off vacation and or vacation only has a two year accrual time, that's why. Because mm-hmm. it gets to a point where it's unmanageable. And we want to be flexible with our team members. And there's things that come up, no doubt about it. Um, but that's the back end. You've hit it right there, Mike. Yeah. And I think I just, I just wanted to mention that because some yeah, people may not be aware of that. Um, one, one more quick question. I know I'm chewing up all our time. No, this is good. Special CE requests, like your ultrasound example, what, what is the norm around vesting? Or is there a norm? So what I mean by that is, let's say I say, you know what, send me to this awesome ultrasound course, it's $5,000. But here's my business case for how much revenue I can bring to the clinic by offering this service. I take the course, and I quit the next week. Right? Not it happens. Not a great situation. So, so how? Yep. So, on both sides of that, what sh- what questions should we be asking, and what might the vet clinic put in place um, to try and you know keep you there to use the skill that they they paid for you to acquire? Yeah, that's awesome. Nice, Mike. So, the first question I'd be asking as an employee: What's this truly going to cost? If the cost of the program, I'm going to use Canada as an example, and going down to the States, whether it's to Texas, Florida, there's a couple other really good programs, and that's going to cost me $9,000 US tuition, I better make sure I convert that over to Canadian before I give it to my employer. Then I better know what my actual accommodations, food prices are, you know, within a a good estimate, because that is going to be a request that you should be putting on top of that as well. So if it's $9,000 for the CE, plus another $2,000 for accommodation, travel expenses, et cetera, include that in your business case. It's to your benefit. But then know if your CE allocation is only $3,000, your employer could ask you to sign something that says, hey, if you leave within the next year or two years, you're going to owe me this back. And it's going to be prorated against the time that you remain after that you've come back from that CE but it's, re- it's, it's right in their realm to be able to do that. And what that means is if you leave a month after coming back, you're going to owe, let's say it's $10,000, you're probably going to owe around 9500 bucks back to that employer and they will come find you and try and get it back. Yeah. No, I've seen that come up. So I just thought I should ask that question, you know, make sure both sides are, are understanding that, that relationship. Totally. Yeah, I love it. And and then from a daily expenses wise, etc. Um, your employer's going to look at your receipts. <laughs> so, so if you're going the to the Cari- for- if you're going to the CE, for, or if you're going to the Caribbean for CE, awesome. As the employer, I, I actually don't mind that. I I think it's good. Like, go get some varied CE. That's the beauty of us being in this profession. Don't go buy Dom Pairing, yo. And put it on your receipts and expect that to go through and not have questions raised. I was just going to ask. I'm talking real life here. Does 10 Corona raise a red flag? (laughs) Depends on the employer. I I don't know. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it does. Right? What's reasonable? What's a reasonable expectation on your time? (laughs) But it's funny how that comes up. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. We're in the essence of time here. We're going to keep, we're going to speed this up. Benefits. What do you have as an expectation for benefits? What I mean by that, dental, health for us in Canada, short-term disability, long-term disability. As an employer, to be able to provide short-term disability is very expensive. The majority of employers, whether it is an independent, uh, whether it is, if it is an independent, likely won't have short-term disability as a part of that benefits plan. Our expectation always is also too, that as a veterinarian, you've gone and got your own disability insurance as well too. And it's to your benefit to have that disability on your own. Again, a full different discussion for a different time. Anything on that, Mike? No, I had my own uh, short-term disability. Um, I guess my only comment coming in as, as an associate vet um, is there value if, if I'm sitting down with you and, and I, you know, we're negotiating and I can tell you, Hey, I've got this taken care of. We can take that off the contract or is that no. just expected? Not really because it's expected and it's already in a plan that the employer has already paid for with whatever 
insurance company that they've partnered with. So they've already got a rate there and it doesn't save. And this is something that as employees, I actually had never recognized this um, before going into business is there's all these additional costs that are on top of your wage. So if you're asking for a hundred grand, actually we put about a 15% number on top of that for your actually actual true employee cost to that business. Mm-hmm. That 15% is all those extras, continuing education, wellness, any, um, uh, uh, clothing allowances, your disability, all those pieces, those all come into that cost. Yeah. And I mean, maybe this is a good point to, to mention, like that's your, your total comp package, right? And th- that's this, correct. Is, this is the world uh, that Rosalie lives in and she'll talk about total comp package. And I do think uh, many people can get very focused on wage and that's, you know, and, and, and granted, that is one of the most important pieces to discuss, yep. but many people will be just hyper-focused and that's the only thing they see. But I think it's important to realize with a contract, there's all these moving parts and, you know, side by side, at, like comparing two contracts, the higher wage may not be the better option. That's correct because there's employees that could offer you a lower wage with a bonus setup that actually makes way more sense in the long term or a signing bonus, right? So perhaps the way, perhaps the employer can't afford that full wage, but they'll pay you some signing bonus that is in a bigger amount to make up for it. They might lock you in for two years instead of one year, but it's to your benefit. There's, there's so much flexibility in there and the more creative, the better. Mm-hmm. Yep. What's a moving allowance look like, right? If you're moving across states, you're moving across provinces, that's completely coverable where that moving allowance reimbursement is then a deduction on the business's profits. So it's, it's in benefit for the employer if they're moving somebody a long distance to actually offer that as part of that comp package, in my view. Again, opinion only, education purposes only. <laughs> um, I think there's a number of things I'm missing. Otherwise, signing bonuses are a big deal this year. Uh, just look into the fine print. Look into the fine print of the signing bonus that you're signing. It should be as clearly laid out as possible without a whole bunch of attachments. Now, that being said, they will likely attach you in some prorated return, which means if you leave within a year, you'll owe a prorated amount back. But in this day and age where there is a need for vets and veterinary technologists, signing bonuses are in action. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then lastly, um, severance as well as... um, Uh, non-competes. I'm going to be very clear on this. And again, a topic in itself, Uh, severance package makes or severance, make sure you read the fine print about what is appropriate for when, or if you are laid off or fired. And usually, and in most instances, again, opinion only, you're going to be let go without cause. Look at what your actual ability to gain compensation looks like. Look in the fine print. And the lastly, in terms of non-competes, non-competes within a short geographical region in a small animal are very eligible. That has been proven, even though there's lots of discussion in the vet field that it's not. And in the large animal or mixed animal field where there's more competition in a wider geographical region, they are also eligible if written correctly and if, if follow through. They are very eligible. This is a kind of a, a fallacy that in veterinary medicine, I'm seeing a little bit too much. Okay, let's let's spend a, t- a bit of time on that because I w- can you clarify this a little bit more? Um, you're, you're saying they're eligible and enforceable, and that's been proven. Yeah. So here's so eligible and enforceable are two different things. I know. Again, I, that's- I'm not. A, I am not a lawyer. I don't really want to go into the woods on here. Seek legal advice ahead of signing something. Because okay. there's some times where those two different, those, those two words are very different. Mm-hmm. And also depending on the situation as opposed, uh, um, related to whether the employer is actually going to try and enforce that non-compete. Yeah. Yeah. And this, again, this is, this is my opinion. Um, I was always told or kind of operated under, you know, what's reasonable. So I'm in the Saskatoon market population of about 300,000. And I moved clinics from sort of far west side Saskatoon over to east side Saskatoon. Um, And I never even looked to see if it was in violation of my non-compete because the lawyers are like, that's totally reasonable, 
right? I didn't set yeah. up across the street yeah. and put up a billboard that says, here I am 150 meters away, right? I would imagine that would have, would have uh, got me in some trouble. So, I mean, that's, that's just me saying that as a personal experience. Totally. And again, here's where I'm not going to go into the weeds because it's so variable depending on uh, both the employer, the, and, and the, even more the case by case basis in which it comes into being just know that as a veterinarian, you, you will be expected to sign a non-compete. And then not trying to take it into the weeds, but trying to separate positions. If you are a new grad associate general veterinarian versus a 20 year specialist, you know, highly trained kind of, there's two of you in Canada, your non-compete is probably going to look different. Yes. <laughs> look at, look at Johnny's politically correct answer. So something just to be aware of, right? Your, it's your role, your experience that's going to dictate your non-compete. What is the value that you're bringing into that practice? And what is the risk of losing you look like? that will help dictate again, not a lawyer, not touching that. And I like where you're trying to get me. I'm just going to say yes. No, I'm not trying to catch you. I'm trying to just, oh, it, it's not a catch. I, it, those are those areas where you go case by case basis. Yeah. Most yeah. definitely. Now in, in terms of giving notice, I do want to jump on that for all of our people that are working on contracts right now. I made this mistake in my first position out. I only gave two weeks notice as a professional first year out, that was not appropriate. That was a mistake that I regret. I don't have many regrets in my profession. That's one of them. And it was not a bad finish. We've left on very good terms. Still, you know, really good friends with some of those individuals. Um, don't do that. Give a month minimum. It's the right thing to do as a professional. I'm speaking. Yeah. That I'm just speaking from the heart here now. Yeah. Um, now in an employer contract, if somebody is requiring 90 days, in my view, that's too long. I think 60 days is a very, very fair ask. Okay. No, that's a great point. Um, and I mean, yeah, that's where there gets to be a difference between, uh, you know, what's the, the exact words written on the contract. Um, and then, you know, the vet world is small. Like, that's it. you know, like even on a global scope, it's small. Everyone knows everyone. So that's just a personal decision. I mean, yeah. there, there'd be a million factors that come in, like what's your personal situation? You know, if something is going on where you just need out, you know, something bad, that's a totally different story. Like we're Agreed. talking about like sort of something where it's an amicable parting of ways, you know, what's yep. just professional courtesy. Yep. And, and in 80% of the cases, literally that's what happens is there's just a ch- change in life, change in focus, change in desire. That's all right. Yeah. Totally. All right. Welcome to the life. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. It's great. So those are some of the major points for today. Uh, there are definitely others there that I have not touched. And if I have not hit one of the major ones, um, please let us know. I, I love this conversation. I want to make sure that everybody is as, as uh, knowledgeable as possible going into this really important juncture of your career whether it's into a new practice or just coming out of school and as an employer that are looking to make the best decisions for their team members yeah and i i do like i know how passionate you are about this we talk about it a ton um i would just say for everyone listening contracts can be one of those things where they can feel overwhelming you know there's there's um, so much here and then each bullet point you can drill into even further And sometimes our tendency is to avoid things that are overwhelming. And this should not be one of those. That's why you bring on the expert like a lawyer, get it reviewed. This is worth your time, um, even if it's not a fun task, right? Like like very few people enjoy combing through a contract, um, but it is worth your time. Love it, Mike. Couldn't have said it better. Nice. Excellent. Well, I would say we're at our end. We're trying something different again this year. Expert series, but then moving to the Mike and Johnny show. We hope you guys have enjoyed this. Leave some comments. If you don't and you want just guests every week and say, hey, Jonathan, Mike, shut up. Let us know. We want to know. Is this actually a valuable use of your time? Because for us, we do this on the fly. This is what we do. And we want to enjoy it with the veterinary or share it with the veterinary community. 
Yeah. And I just want to add to that because this is the first time we're throwing an episode like this at our listeners. We are, we still intend to, and we still are going to deliver um, our regular episode with guests. And we're going to look at doing that on a bi-weekly basis. And then every other week, we're looking at me and Jonathan. Um, and then sometimes we'll be bringing on expert guests still as well. Um, but me and Jonathan just diving into issues. Because when we were looking back, uh, we were noticing some, some holes and some gaps and some issues that really need to be discussed. You know, and we have some, some expertise in these areas to share. So we're, we're taking this opportunity to share that. So let us know what you want to hear about. And if we need to go deeper, for instance, like does there need to be contracts part two or what other topics? So just wanted to add that in. Love it. Thank you, Mike. See your smiling face next week. Thank you for listening to the Veterinary Project Podcast. As a recap, on behalf of our hosts, the Veterinary Project Podcast will be releasing new episodes weekly. So be sure to tune in as we bring you more conversations aimed at helping you enjoy a life well lived. If you enjoyed what you heard on the show and you want to stay in the know, please like, love, and or subscribe to the podcast on the listening platform of your choosing, as we're available on all the usual suspects. If you know of others that may benefit from these conversations, we'd love it if you please share the show with them, as this will help us grow our community to reach more and more veterinary professionals. Speaking of which, if you are a veterinary professional and would like to get connected with more like-minded individuals who are joining us on this journey, please send an email to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com, and we'll invite you to be a part of our private Facebook group. General feedback, requests for information, or perhaps requests to be a guest on the show can also be sent to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com. Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light, thank you for listening to the show, and we'll catch you again next week for another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. Bye for now. Bye.